So, um, hi everybody, I'm Maya. Uh, it's so nice to have you all here. Yeah, so we've heard this morning already in the first key two keynotes about uh, culture, about uh, lead leadership. Um, we heard that um, creating agile culture doesn't work from uh, bottom up. I will, um, this is all so great because I want to uh, talk a bit more about, um, sorry, uh, I made a mistake. It is not working from top down. I want to uh, talk about it, how it can work from bottom up and how it involves testing and agile testing. So, um, thanks a lot for your sponsors. So, um, yeah, I will talk about HL testing, how I started loving it, why I love it, and why should you eventually uh, love it. I have a first opening question with a small prize, like a great Swiss chocolate, because I live in Switzerland. Uh, so, the question is, what would you be prepared to do that others wouldn't? No, that's not that. <laughs> Sorry, that is not a correct answer. Um, Help. Sorry? Help. Help others. Oh, great. Uh, Anela, your. It is for you. Yeah. So, why did I ask you this? Uh, because still, even today, in most of the teams, and very often, testers are seen as bad guys. Testers find defects, they find problems, they uh, identify risks, they usually or sometimes stop uh, releases from going into production. And um, in my past, I was uh, lots of the times upset when I would be seen as a bad guy. And uh, I wasn't popular, always. So, but eventually, I realized, um, first, it is good to uh, po point the problems, because if we always stay on the path of righteousness, and if we don't explore all other paths, then who is going to do that? And also my team, or different teams I've been working at, they also realize there are no bad guys, and it's also not only the tester who needs to be this bad guy. <clears throat> so, I will also focus a bit more in this talk about all these different types of how you will deliver this so-called added value as a tester or also another um, team member. Uh, just a bit more about my history in Agile and doing Agile and being Agile. Um, something similar as Boris and Andreas, I've been in this business uh, quite a long time. Um, at the 2002, actually, uh, it was my first project uh, also following some extreme programming practices. I was actually a software developer at that time. And I was so lucky and incredibly lucky to be working with an external company, consulting company, who was also at that time very advanced in um, practicing all these different already agile methodologies. So, I was uh, sitting together with that team. We were around six to nine persons, so like a typical size of a Scrum team, uh, ideal size. Uh, we had our customer on site. This customer would actually come almost every day to visit us. He was um, reprioritizing our backlog. Uh, we called it a to-do list, but it was practically a backlog. Uh, he reprioritized it together with our project manager, or, or Scrum Master, whatever, uh, with our uh, main software architect. And um, yeah, he was also testing with us. So that was, until today, uh, one of my top three projects, and it was like 16 years ago. Then some time passed, I switched eventually to another company. I was still working as a software developer, but the project was completely different at that time. At, in 2010, I, was, uh, I had to maintain some older legacy code. It was at that time already seven years old, not properly documented. Um, I was completely new to this also business field. And um, 
uh, I was, uh, we were only two developers. Uh, I was part-time developer, the other guy full-time developer, but we were, we were just basically throwing this code over the fence to our customer. We would deploy some uh, release candidate, and um, the customer was supposed to do customer acceptance tests and to say, yeah, it's ready to go into production. And um, very soon, actually, we noticed that this customer is struggling with these tests. He didn't have a proper test data. We also actually didn't have those data. Our test environment wasn't stable. It wasn't a real integration environment. So I, this, this whole topic with uh, testing really intrigued me. Uh, because as a developer, you normally write unit tests. You try to follow the practices of test-driven development to first write a failing test and to write a code that fixes it, and you know, then you think it's fine, it works. Um, and, and again, I started working very closely again to this customer. Um, we started testing together on the phone, uh, live, and so on, and we noticed that uh, we, we, uh, by working together while um, joining forces like me as a developer who knew why or mostly knew how this code should work and why it is like that but the on the other side we had a customer who was expecting actually something different and then again we joined this uh, uh, different understandings to get the shared understanding of this product and uh, in that way we were very much able to um, identify a lot of defects already of course in the test environment and then, of course, to identify what the features should be, uh, what the new features should be, and so on. So, um, th this was just um, um, actually start of my learning about testing, and it was more like learning by doing. On my next job, I was actually officially agile tester because while testing this application, as explained before. I started really loving testing. I also realized that with my skills, not only with developer mindset, that I, I realized I have some other social skills, communication skills, helper skills, that will help me being a good tester. And um, I was introduced to the book, uh, the first one about agile testing by Lisa and Janet. That is the, this definition is actually, you won't find it in the book, but on this uh, link here. And this definition was compiled uh, by Lisa, Janet, and the whole Agile testing community. Because if you read the book, you will not find a one or two sentences definition. It is so many things. And it is very much important to say it occurs from this inception, like from this first idea you might have about your product until the realization, and it happens continuously and iteratively, and um, it is really focused on defect prevention rather than defect detection. So, <clears throat> we've heard a lot about Agile Manifest in the first uh, or the second keynote, uh, again, Agile testing adheres so much on the Agile Manifesto, um, especially on these uh, four um, principles that, uh, may, that, um, that are uh, provide continuous feedback, enable face-to-face -face communication, have courage, and keep it simple. Uh, but let me just break down all of them uh, shortly. So, what does it mean to provide continuous feedback? Uh, for example, if you're a tester and you run some tests or you have results of your automated tests, you should really react uh, very quickly. Don't wait for the next daily. Just say it, say it, go to your developer. Ideally, you are sitting all together, so just shut out and say, I have something very important here, but I need to interrupt you. I mean, nobody likes to be interrupted, but during the circumstances, it has to. So this whole continuous feedback about your test results or about acceptance criteria, if we see that acceptance criteria are fulfilled, then it is a very good feedback. If they are not, then again, you explore those other not happy paths. Then if we are talking about uh, delivering value to the customer, 
um, again by fulfillment of your different acceptance tests of all, all of sorry or all of different uh, types of tests you will uh, certainly deliver this uh, this added value and this information um, regarding a face to face communication um, it is not a myth it is really reality that testers normally have just a bit more better communication skills and are even more courageous to to go straight to the whatever stakeholder that is, um, is it a customer, is it a product owner or the other developer or a designer, to get all these people together um, and to bridge this communication gap. Then uh, having courage, of course for all of that you need courage. You, you need courage to, we know uh, when you develop in a, like one or two week sprints, everything happens very fast and it is a very fast paced environment. So. Um, you need courage to sustain this pace. I mean, if we are honest, it is not easy. And sometimes you start a sprint, you think, oh, you have time, but then it's already the second week of the sprint, and then the sprint is over, and you are not really, really done with everything. So you need courage to, to improve these whole iterations. You need courage to inspect and adapt and to fail fast, as also somebody already said in the first, um, uh, not somebody, <laughs> Boris and Andreas. So uh, you need courage. Then you have to keep it simple. Um, already while iterating um, in the short iterations and very fast, uh, we already in that way keep everything simple because we are not really developing like huge stuff all the time. So we, we uh, ideally develop simple, smaller, component solutions ads on your code, which should be simple. But again, as a tester, you should again remind your team, remind your customers, and also explain to the customer why he's not getting his final product already in one or two weeks, why it takes time. Then, uh, practice continuous improvement. Um, again, uh, keep learning, keep exploring. If you are a tester or any other role, Every role should be taken as uh, or, or lived as a, a profession. And if you have this profession, you should also invest your free time or also your working time to further learn and to advance and to master your skills. Response to change means, um, again, uh, you need to react fast. You need to react fast on your test results, for example. You need to react fast on all different changes in your backlog, or even, even during the sprint, you might have changed your backlog, uh, sprint backlog. And again, you have to, um, you have to enable also others uh, to do that. Uh, regarding self-organizing, as also already mentioned, uh, the, the quality, actually. I think I'm now uh, mentioning this word for the first time. <laughs> Um, but that wasn't, um, yeah, it is very important, the uh, quality of your product, and it is really shared responsibility, so the whole team is responsible. Um, so this whole self-organization should be done in the way that a team should be able to organize by themselves. And if they can't, maybe, or ideally the tester could help them to say, I, uh, can you please do this test together with me, or can you automate this test, or, or whatever, or whatever helps to do it better. Then focus on people. Again, as I also said, everybody shares this responsibility, but it can be a tester who brings again these people together and uh, this focus on people and not resources, yes. So, um, the last one, and, but not the least, is enjoy. Um, I really hope that everybody here hopefully, uh, hopefully enjoys uh, their jobs. I can tell you I really enjoy mine, I have fun. Even if I get upset uh, when there are some problems, even if I get upset when I think this product is not so good, or already during the inception phase I think, why oh, we are really developing this, is this really needed? It is um, very important to never forget to enjoy, to have fun, and also to, to know that as a tester or as a developer, product owner, whatever, 
you are really making this change. You are enabling your team, you are enabling your colleagues, and you are working together on the same stuff. Um, about this power of free, this is also elaborated a lot in the Agile Testing book. Uh, some other people call it free amigos, as free friends, because like um, uh, we have developer, we have product owner and a tester who should ideally work together. And in this uh, breakout, in this, in this kind of workflow, uh, this is just uh, to show, for example, if we have one sprint and if we are talking about, for example, one user story, how exactly or how more or less you should work together in order to fulfill the definition of done. So already during the backlog refinement, you should already then have some test ideas. And again, as a tester, you are responsible. Your task is to already then um, challenge and, and um, uh, the quest to question the all different implicit assumptions. Uh, this is also what happens to me most of the time when the user stories are vague, if they are not maybe following this so-called invest principle, or if you, if you have any doubt that something might go wrong or that something is wrong, just say it already then. And if you get the answer, oh, it will be fine, challenge it again. And um, challenge it continuously until, until it's really getting better. So, Again, we had this refinement, we reprioritized the backlog, we have a sprint planning. Ideally, during the planning too, you should already have some most important cases. And this is not that you have to write a lot of test cases by hand or even code. Just, you can use mind map, just try to make it simple and not to over document it, of course. And Again, ideally during the planning too, tester sits with developer for like five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it takes, and as long you have some time, and discuss those test ideas. We call it shared test ideas. So they might be shared or you are sharing them, so as you wish. Um, as a result, you have some test design. Again, it is up to you and to your context how you're going to design it. Uh, and you run already some tests as long um, as soon as you have some code to run them against. And you have some first results. And then again, as said, provide continuous feedback, show that results, talk about them. Um, it is always good to have uh, recurring um, uh, blockers in your, in your calendar to say, for example, the sprint starts on Monday, you might already have some results on, on Wednesday, and then already on Wednesday afternoon, have this recurring show, uh, show me session um, uh, calendar invitation for your, one of your developers. And after that session, you might have another findings, and then you, it goes further, you continue the tests, uh, of course, there is a new bug fix or whatever changes. At some point, tester, uh, the developer says, oh, now it is done, now it is implemented, now it should be good. Then you find something again. You run all different automated tests, explorative tests, whatever it takes. And this whole thing, this whole uh, workflow is recurring. So again, this was just for one story, for example, one bug fix and so on. <clears throat> um, I think this one is very familiar to at least some of you. Please raise your hand. Does it look familiar? Okay, a few people, thank you. So this is also uh, 10 years old now. Uh, and I'm always amazed that, um, yeah, it is still not very much known and not only known, you need to implement it, you need to use it. And it is about different types of testing, different, different uh, focuses, so to say. Either your tests are technology or business facing, either they are critiquing the product or making it easier for you as a team to develop it. Um, so, yes, again, as mentioned, as a developer, you might, uh, or, or ideally, you would write some unit tests. 
then there is though so many other types of tests. You should do some prototypes, some simulations. You should also do a lot of exploratory testing. As mentioned, user acceptance tests, alpha beta tests, uh, and all these other ility tests. Then, there are, this one is based actually, uh, Lisa and Janet based it on a very original quadrants by Brian Merrick. But you can imagine during the years there have been some slight uh, modifications to this one. And this is one of them by Gojko Adžić, a guy from Belgrade and uh, living in UK since a long time. Very famous for his uh, specification by example book, uh, impact mapping and so on. And he changed just a bit the content of the quadrants, but um, this one is actually the, the main change. So you are checking for expected results versus checking for all other unknowns and unexpected and um, undefined outputs. Then there is one more, at least one more, sorry, by James Bach and Michael Bolton. They are also very, very famous in the uh, rapid software testing and context-driven testing community because, again, it all depends on the context. And uh, this one is a bit um, younger, four years uh, old or young. And actually, everything is about all these principles and activities that infuse all testing. Um, I really encourage you to, um, to study all these different quadrants and all these different links, because if you click on this source, you will see it is like around 30 pages presentation, and there are certainly a lot of blog posts by them explaining it in more detail. But again, you start with idea. You, you start with discovering something which is worth building. Then you try to build these first prototypes or first iterations to see uh, and really not, not forget to keep it simple and to keep it um, with a change in mind. Uh, and then you iterate. And through this whole process, of building up on your main idea, or first idea, it doesn't have to be the, the last, you will, you will perform all these different activities of deep testing, output checking, any other preparations. <clears throat> then, regarding test automation, um, I'm not a real, real expert in test automation. I have to admit that I spend like really most of my time doing some exploratory tests and talking to others. Yes, so, but what I know, at least this, is uh, don't, don't think you will have just one tool that will solve your problems. Um, don't trust all these, uh, I don't know, companies that sell all these different products, even this cloud, uh, whatever swarming, uh, yeah. I mean, you may, I, it's your choice, but never forget to have this set of tools, as uh, Andrea said when talking about culture, now we, when we're talking about more technical stuff, we again have a toolbox. So it, it, these tools, or set of tools, they have to, um, they have to be, um, you, have, you need to have everybody on board, and um, everybody, uh, including developers, testers, or, or also product owner, needs to agree that those tools we know how to use and why we are using them. We are not automating just to automate, but we are automating to, uh, to find our risks, to identify risks um, uh, sooner, and also, of course, to prioritize the business value. And this is just a very short list of uh, some people who, really, who I really admire, who are really, really experts in uh, test automation. Uh, for example, Richard and Mark, they run their automation in testing course and website, where you exactly learn why and how you're going to automate on the conceptual level, not like learning Java or learning Python or learning any Selenium um, or whatever. 
Then Alan Richardson, you can check out his YouTube. I mean, um, I hope the links will work in PDF, otherwise I will send them again. Um, then Adrian, a really smart guy, a real expert, also as an agile coach, a software design expert, pair programming, all this other stuff that will help you. Angie, Katrina, and here, I, uh, I mean, if you, if you Google for test automation pyramid, you will find like hundreds and hundreds of different results, blogs. Um, it all started with, uh, I think, Martin Fowler or who? No, sorry. Who was the first guy? Uh, Kentbeck? Oh, I forgot. Who coined the first pyramid? Mike Cohn. Mike Cohn. I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah. So, uh, uh, again, uh, and this first... I'm trying to be funny. Uh, so, uh, this first guy, th this first pyramid had only three levels, like unit, um, integration, um, and uh, UI tests. But I like this one especially because it has system and acceptance tests on top of UI tests, and it also don't, doesn't forget about static testing. If you're looking, uh, if you're using all this other static analysis tool to analyze your code and already while analyzing the code to find different patterns that might lead to different problems. Just don't forget about that. I've been also working in different projects and I'm also always amazed to have in every project it's a different pyramid. So again, this one by Steve, I would say for me it's more or less perfect. Then all this test automation is very also important to when you want to really have a real DevOps project. And here you see actually that on all stages of a DevOps tool chain, testing happens. It happens while you create this first, first uh, plan. You need to, again to challenge and to test all these ideas and assumptions. Then you create a branch, you start building, you start coding, you need to test. You merge the code, you need to test it. Uh, after you deploy it into production, when you monitor it, you need to test it. We are today uh, talking more and more about this so-called agnostic testing. So don't spend so much time with this pre-testing. Uh, I did explain before that you should test a lot during the sprint. But also, don't always invest all your time in testing in test environment. And don't forget about production environment. Test in production as well. Monitor it and uh, yeah, make it. Um, so and and in, the, in this case, we say it is not only DevOps. It is like Dev test ops. And this whole continuous testing is a really a process that happens continuously. You run all your, all your, you execute all your different manual and automated tests all the time to get all this immediate feedback on different business risks, on different results, and to add this value. Oh, sorry. This was, I get, sorry. Now you had some sneak peek. So, uh, yes, um, as also mentioned in the abstract, I am not only working as a tester, but like a test lead. And uh, you're, due to some, um, how shall I say, the, the, the whole project um, um, developed, in, we have more and more components, we have more and more code to, that has to be tested. We have more and more variations when we are talking about mobile apps, you have all these different devices. And then you can imagine you might lack some people who would test or, or do some automated tests. Honestly, we don't really run our UI uh, mobile automated tests, we don't have any actually. But it works. I mean, I've never experienced that something that worked before would, would like go broken in, in yeah, some very simple stuff. So we said for us the risk of uh, or this cost of automated tests for some very main um, like clicking scenarios is too high and also to maintain those tests 
we are running them manually. And actually, in that case, if we have even some new changes, we are involving our crowd to get into this dirt of testing on all different devices and different, um, different scenarios. And um, I actually had uh, quite fair good experiences with crowd testing. If you want to have more details about that, you can check out my blog. And uh, again, it was more focused not only on functional tests, but also on some usability tests, um, uh, user tests, uh, how they, how they are, um, in, we, we were always looking forward to their input if they find it uh, clear or, or uh, usable or does it work, uh, of course, so on. So, um, also as a test lead, I, I see myself actually as a coach and as an enabler to all other junior testers um, and to all other uh, developers as long as they want to listen and I get to them. Um, so, what might be though the challenges when you have a test team or even when you have a scrum team? And those are um, different quality. Uh, so, yeah, some, some code might be not good, but also some test results might be not good. And then, if you are a fairly experienced tester and test lead, you should really help all these juniors or, or younger unexperienced tester to understand how to test better, to coach them, to sit them near you, to collaborate. Sorry. Then there is a motivation and commitment. I don't uh, remember if we mentioned them in the first two keynotes. Motivation just a bit and this commitment, but I think that is a really crucial. And. Um, it doesn't really have to come from bottom up. You should really find a way to, to identify with your team and with your product you're developing. Then this proactivity, it is also very important experience and the recognition. And the recognition for testers, it can happen that as a tester, you might be seen as less valuable resource, so to say. But if you continue working on all these different um, um, uh, techniques or, or, um, or um, uh, practices, then you will eventually um, uh, explain that testing is not just very easy. Even if you have some junior people uh, working and testing, it is not that everybody can do testing. And this text expertise is very important. And again, it is your role and your task to, uh, to organize uh, different sessions where you will talk about your experiences, about your know-how and share that know-how. And in my experience, these so-called pair testing sessions or joint testing sessions really helped to get everybody together in one room to test together for 30 minutes, for one hour, for two hours, I don't know how long it takes. And uh, then when you test together and when you also have your product owner with you especially, then he or she might understand that it takes some time. It takes some time to run tests, to analyze the results, to understand why the results are as they are and so on. And also, uh, never forget uh, about that you should know each other. Uh, depending on your company culture or even the culture of a country where you work, uh, work or live at, it can be different. You might have people who just want to work from 9 to 5 and then go home and don't have any other interaction with you because then they're free. Still, um, in my case and also in my um, mindset, I, I like to engage with others and uh, I like to, to use any chance to talk with them as people, to show my interest in them, um, maybe what they did over the weekend, what sports are they doing, whatever concerns them to exchange experiences also about work, whatever, but just get to know them better. And then again, depending on the culture, 
those kind of events can be already structured and organized with some, with some beer every Friday or whatever. But again, uh, don't forget that it is you who should drive that change. And also, maybe you have also still some people who are not so open. But again, as we already said, if you show your vulnerability, if you uh, give them trust, if you sh explain them maybe some funny anecdote about your day, then you will see from day to day, they will eventually also change and open a bit. How much time do I have? So, five minutes. Okay, I'll have to speed this up a bit. So, um, also, as a tester or as a part of the cross-functional Scrum team, I was also working a lot with people who were mainly, uh, whose mainly role was customer support. And in our case, in one of the last projects at Swisscom, we actually insourced customer support because we noticed that this, that this customer support department who is supposed to do some first or second level support for our applications, they don't know them so much. I mean, we might deliver them some kind of documentation or explanation, but if they don't use it, if they're not part of our Scrum team, they, do, they, they certainly can't know all those details and reasons why something might be not working as customer thinks. And I also need to say here, in this case, we are developing application for our private customers, like B2C market, and it is really hard because you can imagine you might have 100,000 of users, which is a lot for us in Switzerland, and all, every user might have different expectations. So what we did, we again, we incorporated customer support in our team. We created new roles and, um, and, um, um, and uh, 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 employed people who, whose main role is customer support. But then again, they were also very overbooked. And uh, again, since they are not really te developers or testers, we noticed they might also lack some understanding. So what we did as a next step is, um, actually, we said every team, and we have four teams, um, every team needs one main person who is doing this customer support every week, either is it a developer or tester or even product owner, and then they are like uh, recurring, uh, recurringly changing their like tasks every week, and that works very good. So again, for me, this customer support is, should be a part of the team, and here you see this intersection between product owner and customer, uh, and the, and the cross-functional team, and actually, ideally, if you ask me, that should all be together, and it shouldn't be only the product owner who is uh, only owning the product and making all different decisions. And then there is um, some other, te the, um, at least some a few techniques I wanted just very quickly to, uh, to mention. Um, we saw this DevOps tool chain. We saw that you have an idea, you build it, you deploy it, then you monitor it, then you change it and so on. But what if we already test this first idea and this uh, design sprint uh, technique based on design thinking is doing exactly that. So you have idea, you have uh, again different roles uh, sitting or, or working together during um, 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 normally five days a week. This whole five days is the length of your design sprint. And then you iterate, iterate on that idea and these learnings until you say, okay, now we are building it or launching. Then there is this impact mapping, um, which was adapted from different sources by Goiko and put everything together and explained in his book years ago. And it is all about your goal, your actors or stakeholders, your impact and deliverables. I also encourage you to check it out. Check it out. Um, I've been running Agile testing meetups for four years, between 2014 and this spring. 
I started organizing them when I noticed, you can imagine, uh, almost five years ago, I, there were not so many people in my company who, would, who were doing testing or not even agile testing. Uh, I mean, I see now already here in this crowd, maybe like 20 persons know about the book or the quadrants or whatever. So I realized I, I want to share my um, knowledge and also my experiences and to get more um, know-how back. So it was really a lot about sharing and building up this community. And I put a lot of energy, ideas, passion in that, but eventually during my role as a software tester, as also explained, um, while critiquing the whole idea of a product, I realized I want to do a bit more, a bit more than uh, testing assumptions. Sorry, let me just show you this. Uh, this is my road. And one minute, okay. Okay, um, so I, I realized I want to do a, a more than testing, more than uh, testing prototypes, testing ideas, testing assumptions. I want to help drive a product. I want to help um, write some business cases, value propositions, and that is what I've been doing now since two months uh, only. I'm completely uh, still new, um, and for me it was a great experience already in the first days because this is what actually I wanted to do, so it's all my responsibility for changing this role. And now I have uh, not private customers, we, I'm working in a project for enterprise customers, so it might be a bit easier to understand what and why they want something. But uh, again, this whole concept is, um, and the, the, the tasks are, are different. And I'm very much looking forward to next month and to see what, where this will lead me. But the main point is, um, if you are a developer, if you are a tester, you need to step out of your comfort zone, you need to uh, evolve, and you need to, to do the things that others might not be ready to do. You need to set an example. And uh, yes, you, you should never stop learning and exploring. And um, through, this, through this journey, you might surprise yourself and you will certainly also surprise others. So, um, this is just again very short list about uh, literature, blogs and books that really inspired me from where I learned so much. And also, men as mentioned, there is so many other sources. I again encourage you to develop your toolbox, to develop your top five, top ten books, and to really apply them and to implement them. And uh, again, here are my contacts, and thanks for the sponsors, and thank you again for being here. Uh, thank you, Maya.